Thank you, John. Thank you, Father Gruner, for your gracious invitation today. I'm going to speak to you today about the errors of Freemasonry and the connection between Freemasonry, Our Lady, and the message of Fatima. As we know, Masonry is an enemy of the Church, and as we'll learn today, Our Lady has warned us for many centuries that Freemasonry would penetrate the Church, would corrupt the hierarchy, and lead souls to damnation. In this presentation, I'm going to first talk about some very important historical points that connect Masonry with Our Lady. I'm then going to talk about Masonic ritual and finally conclude with the effect that Freemasonry has had on the Catholic Church. So why am I qualified to talk about this? Well, as John has indicated, although I am a cradle Catholic, a lifelong Catholic, I also became a Freemason. Out of law school, I was solicited to join Freemasonry by many Catholic men, and that's very common in America. It was presented to me as simply a social club, an organization that would help me develop business contacts. And I was under the impression that American Freemasonry differed from European Freemasonry, and that's how it was explained to me. In fact, seeking some counsel from parish priests, they said the same thing. And so I didn't feel the need to investigate it any further. And in this period in my life, uh, I became a Master Mason, a 32nd degree Mason, a member of the Shriners. I was a member of two Masonic lodges. I served as principal officer in one of those lodges. I was about to be elected Worshipful Master before I left. And I received a very rare credential called the Proficiency Card, which authorized me to instruct other Masons in Masonic ritual. It literally requires a man to have committed to memory all of the rituals of Blue Lodge Freemasonry, all of the positions, and that's what I could do. So I know what Freemasonry teaches because I taught it myself. As I said, in America, Masonry is not deemed to be harmful. It seems to be simply a social organization, and I've often asked myself, why is that? Why is it perceived differently in Europe? And the reason is, America was never a Catholic country to begin with. America was founded by Freemasons. And the ideology of Freemasonry is enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. For example, the Establishment Clause, where the government won't respect any religion. That's a denial of the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Free Exercise Clause, which gives man a right to practice any religion. Again, contrary to the Catholic faith. And so America lives the religion of Freemasonry. That's why Masonry is not deemed to be a threat. And it was, in fact, United States Supreme Court justices who created the doctrine of separation of church and state in the United States. Under Presidents Roosevelt, Truman, and Eisenhower, all of whom were Freemasons, they appointed in collectively 12 Supreme Court justices, all of whom were Masons, and from 1941 to 1971, Masons dominated the Supreme Court and through those judicial decisions created the Masonic doctrine of separation of church and state. Now, Catholics, of course, should know better because there have been uh, very infrequent con uh, condemnations of some other errors, but not as many as Freemasonry. In my research, I've discovered 12 popes issuing no less than 23 separate condemnations on Freemasonry. And these teachings are considered part of the ordinary and universal magisterium of the church. They're binding on the souls of all Catholics. The church has always been very clear about the church's position on masonry. Now I'm going to turn to Fatima and try to give you a perspective of how Fatima and masonry are connected. We know about the three secrets or the three parts of the secret. First, we have a vision of hell. Secondly, Our Lady revealed of the, warned of the errors of Russia and the need to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart. And third, there's the vision of the bishop dressed in white. So without any other information, what we see there is a warning of errors, of people going to hell, and somehow the church being involved, because the pope is involved in the third part. Then we have Sister Lucia's fourth memoir, where she says, in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved etc., of course, implying that the dogma of the faith will not be preserved elsewhere. Why? Because of these errors. 
So what we have are the errors of Russia poisoning the world and the church and leading souls to hell. So what are the errors of Russia? They're the same as the errors of Freemasonry. They're one and the same. In short, a rejection of Jesus Christ and his holy Catholic Church. A rejection of God-made man and the exaltation of man-made God. A rejection of the supernatural and an exaltation of the natural. That's why Masonry wants a religion of naturalism. We can all be brothers on the natural level, but if we reject the supernatural level, we cannot in the order of grace. We're only brothers and sisters when we're united to Christ in his mystical body through grace. And so ultimately, this is a question of God versus Satan. And that's how Sister Lucia put it. She said that Satan was in the mood for a decisive battle with Our Lady, and we must choose. Now, I mentioned that Our Lady has warned us of these errors long before Fatima, and she did so in apparitions at Quito, Ecuador, at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century. These revelations prefigure Fatima, and you're going to see why. Our Lady and Our Lord appeared to a religious named Sister Mariana de Jesus Torres, and Paul V has acknowledged, Pope Paul V has acknowledged these apparitions. They've been acknowledged by the church at large. In fact, Sister Mariana's body was exhumed in 1885, 271 years after she died, incorrupt. And in one of the apparitions in 1582, Our Lord and Our Lady appear to Sister Mariana. And Sister saw Jesus Christ suffering his passion on the cross. But coincident with Our Lord's suffering, Sister Mariana also saw the church and smoke entering the church, enveloping the church. That reminds us of Paul VI's statement that the smoke of Satan has entered the church. Our Lady and Our Lord gave that revelation to Sister Mariana 400 years before Paul VI confirmed that it happened. And an angel of God appeared and said that God was going to give Sister Mariana a secret, using the same terminology at Fatima. And the secret that was communicated by Our Lady was that God the Father was going to punish the criminal world for its sins, and it was going to suffer these punishments in the 20th century. 400 years before then, our current time. Sister Mariana also saw three swords above our Lord's head. And they represented the sins for which humanity was going to be punished. Heresy, impiety, and impurity. Heresy, of course, reflects the doctrine of the church. Impiety deals with the expression of the doctrine. And impurity deals with the morality that follows the doctrine. And Our Lady asked Mariana, just like she asked Lucia, whether she was willing to sacrifice for the people of this time. And she said she was. And similar to Fatima, Our Lady continued to appear to Sister Mariana. For example, in one of these apparitions, she showed Sister Mariana Satan, the serpent engulfed in hellfire while she was in her cell, similar to the vision of hell that the three seers had. She also showed Sister Mariana the infant Jesus, just like the infant Jesus appeared at Fatima with St. Joseph. She identified herself as Our Lady of Good Success, and she said that humanity must do penance in order to appease the wrath of God or they will be punished for their sins. The same message of Fatima. In another apparition, St. Gabriel appeared with a chalice with Our Lord's blood in it and a ciborium of hosts very similar to the angel of Portugal. All of these prefigured Fatima, and the message is the same. In 1599, Our Lady told Sister Mariana that in 200 years, Freemasonry would take control of the Ecuadorian government and persecute the church. And she predicted that a future president, Catholic president, would be assassinated. This happened. Garcia Moreno, Catholic president, was martyred in 1875, two years after he consecrated Ecuador to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And his heart is incorrupt. And then in 1610, Our Lady gave an astonishing statement. She said, 
Satan would reign almost exclusively through Freemasonry. Remember, we're talking about the 20th century. Remember, we're talking about the smoke of Satan, the smoke of Freemasonry entering into the church. The wild boar will enter into the vineyard, corrupt the souls, both lay and consecrated, and lead them to damnation. In this apparition, Our Lady also warned that there would be a corruption of customs. The church calls them immemorial or ecclesiastical customs. The way we dress, the necessity for women to cover their heads in church while they pray, receiving communion, kneeling on the tongue, and so forth. She said in the 20th century there would be a profanation of the Eucharist. She said that hosts would be stolen and trampled underfoot, which was nearly impossible until the abuse of communion in the hand was introduced in the 20th century. She said the sacraments of baptism, confession, confirmation, and extreme unction would fall into disuse. They would decline. She said that matrimony would be profaned. She said that the devil will attack priests, will corrupt them, will scandalize the faithful, and lead souls to hell. In short, Our Lady predicted that in the 20th century, the church would be attacked by Freemasonry, and it would cause a crisis in the faith. And in light of Fatima, this means that the heirs of Russia are the heirs of Freemasonry, a naturalism which the popes teach us leads to a practical atheism. Now, Our Lady's warnings at Quito were confirmed by Pope Gregory XVI in the 19th century when he discovered a document that is often known as the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita, written by a version of Freemasonry called the Carbonari. And this was a blueprint for subverting the Catholic Church by infiltrating it with liberal ideas, in effect, to have a Masonic revolution in the Church. The Masons wanted to get into the seminaries, into the monasteries, even into the schools, and they've always had a fanatical uh, desire to corrupt children and produce a pope that the document says would be according to our needs, a pope that would be sympathetic to humanitarian principles to liberty, equality, fraternity, human dignity, all at the expense of truth. Blessed Pius IX and Leo XIII ordered that the Alta Vendita be published. And when Blessed Pius IX wrote his syllabus of errors condemning religious liberty and indifferentism, and Pope Leo XIII wrote Humanum Genus, they certainly had the Alta Vendita in mind. So what Our Lady at Quito in the 16th century predicted was formally conceived by Freemasonry in the 19th century to affect the church in the 20th century. Now, back to Fatima. Why Portugal? Why did Our Lady come there? Well, like Ecuador, like Mexico, like Spain, there was a Masonic revolution in Portugal. In 1910, the Masons killed the king, King Carlos, they set up a provisional government by force of arms, and they immediately began to attack the church. They suppressed religious orders, they banished clergy, they stole church property, they outlawed the oaths that were required to be sworn in court, even the oaths that children had to swear to defend the Immaculate Conception. They legalized divorce, they called marriage a civil contract only, they required work on religious holidays. In fact, the Masonic Square encompasses even appeared on Portuguese currency. And the leader of Freemasonry, one Magalhas Lima, declared that Masonry would destroy the faith in Portugal. And it was under these conditions that Our Lady came to Portugal. In fact, Our Lady's statement that in Portugal the dogma will always be preserved is a response, a direct response to the declaration of Portuguese Freemasonry that they would destroy the faith. You see the strong connection between Fatima and Freemasonry. We all know what happened after Our Lady appeared. Arturo Santos, the mayor, the Masonic mayor, fought against the movement of Fatima. He himself was a Mason. He founded his own Masonic lodge in Fatima, and we know what he did to the three seers. He kidnapped the children, he imprisoned them, he threatened to kill them. There was a local lodge at Santarem which mocked the visions of Freemasonry. They had Masonic processions through Fatima, chanting blasphemous litanies to Our Lady. They stole religious articles. 
Their hatred was so fanatical against Fatima that in March 6, 1921, they bombed the chapel at the Kova. But something happened. In 1931, the bishops decided to consecrate Portugal to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, hence affecting a counter-revolution. President Bernardino Macado, who was a Masonic president, fell from power. And Antonio Salazar rose to power in 1935. He banned Freemasonry. And just as Masonry was defeated in Portugal through the act of consecration, so the same will happen once the Pope consecrates Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. <coughs> Fatima, however, is still a target of Freemasonry. In 2003, there was a pan-religious gathering at the Paul VI Center adjacent to the site of Fatima where pagans came in and talked about how their worship and their, their sanctuaries were important. And if you read the accounts of this pan-religious gathering, the, the Fatima revelations were never mentioned. An ecumenism of non-conversion was preached, and the church's infallible teaching, extra ecclesium nulla salus est, no salvation outside the church, was effectively denounced. In other words, they preached Freemasonry at Fatima. This is more evidence of Our Lady's warnings of a Masonic movement toward a one-world religion. Now, let's talk about Russia. Why Russia? Why is Russia the object of the consecration? Well, we've already briefly explained her errors, but at this time when Our Lady appeared, there was also a Masonic re revolution in Russia, affected by lodges at St. Petersburg. Again, this happened in 1917, the very year Our Lady appeared, foretelling that she would ask for the consecration of Russia. And then in 1929, she came to say that the time has come for the consecration. Why then? Why in 1929? Well, many point out that Stalin at that time had made the Russian Orthodox sect an arm of the atheistic state in order to better influence their brand of ecumenism, which in their view is to put all religions on the same level, thereby subverting the true religion of Jesus Christ. And the Russian Orthodox sect joined the World Council of Churches, and they do hold leadership positions in the WCC. This is a Masonic organization. This is a syncretist organization that is seeking the unification of religions. The World Council of Churches is even currently pressuring Catholic bishops to have ecumenical celebrations of the Mass with non-Catholics. Again, the error of indifferentism which leads to a practical atheism. So God is using Russia as an instrument of chastisement materially through the violence and the butchering of millions under the evil leaders of Russia but also spiritually by allowing her errors to spread throughout the world. And it was because of the Russian Orthodox presence at the Ecumenical Council, the Second Ecumenical Council, that John XXIII and Paul VI did not condemn communism. Many also say that it's for fear of not offending the Russian Orthodox that the popes have yet to consecrate Russia. Although I think the problem is even deeper than that. I think it's because of the crisis of faith in the church. I think the secret may indicate that there are going to be a string of popes who simply don't believe in the message of Fatima. This goes beyond fear of human respect. And so the point is, on a spiritual level, Russia continues to carry out the Masonic plan of the Alta Vendita for a one-world religion where man is exalted and God is denied. And this is why Russia must be consecrated. You know, St. Paul says in the last times that the Antichrist will put an idol in the temple of God. And one must wonder whether an ecumenical celebration of the Mass where non-Catholics say the words of consecration will give rise to this idolatry since no transubstantiation is going to be affected. Could this be the abomination of desolation that was prophesied by Daniel and our Lord? We saw ecumenists paving the way for such ecumenical celebrations of false religions at the Fatima Shrine. In summary, the third secret may contain information regarding the Masonic origin of the apostasy in the church. And if Masons were controlling the church, they would be bound to suppress the third secret. Why? Because it would alert the faithful to the crisis that they caused and the means by which they caused it. It would point the finger directly at them. And since their goal is the complete destruction of the Catholic Church, they won't be allowed the evil forces of masonry 
are pressing for it to remain suppressed. Of course, since we know that the church can never be destroyed based on our Lord's promises, this will never happen. The secret will be revealed and the consecration will be affected. So the point here is that masonry is rele relevant to Fatima and it may be the very object of Our Lady's warnings in the third secret. Briefly, the origins of Freemasonry. Evidence is that Jews, Russian Jews, created Freemasonry to subvert and mock the religion of Jesus Christ. And there are many elements of Judaism in Masonic ritual. For example, the Mosaic laws mentioned, the King Solomon's temple, the Sanctorum, Sanctum Sanctorum, and so forth. Masons generally claim that their craft arose out of the uh, operative Freemasons who used to build the physical structures, the cathedrals in Europe. But during the Enlightenment period, and this was a period during which there was a movement to free men from ecclesiastical authority and supernatural revelation, there was a movement to invite others into Freemasonry, bankers, lawyers, merchants, etc. And that's called speculative Freemasonry. So Freemasonry practiced today is ultimately a spiritual organization because just as the operative Masons used to build the physical structures, today's Freemasons seek to build the, the spiritual structure, the soul, and its rituals are spiritually oriented. And Freemasonry's rejection of the supernatural truths of the faith and its promotion of naturalism are clearly embodied in Masonic ritual, and I'm now going to give you some examples. In the first degree of Freemasonry, and th these rituals are rituals that are universal. All men who go into Freemasonry experience what I'm going to tell you. In the first degree, the candidate for Freemasonry was required to strip down, take all his clothes off except his underwear, but that's not all. He's also required to remove his crucifix, his scapular, even his wedding ring. Because as the ritual specifically says, a man is to take nothing, quote, offensive or defensive into the lodge. Offensive because Catholicism offends Freemasonry and defensive because they want the man vulnerable. They do not want him to have a spiritual offense. Also, a noose is placed around the man's neck. And this noose symbolizes his, his attachment to the profane world, his former religion. You will see that that noose is removed when he finally enters into the covenant with Freemasonry. A blindfold is also placed on his eyes, and he is declared to be in a state of spiritual darkness. They said, this is Mr. John Salza, who has long been in darkness and now seeks to be brought to light. Well, I only had the blindfold on for a couple minutes. They were obviously talking about the fact that even though I was baptized into the light of Jesus Christ, I was in a state of spiritual darkness. And then when the man comes into the lodge, he's received on the point of a sharp instrument, piercing his naked left breast. And they say that as this is an instrument of torture to your flesh, so should the recollection of it be to your conscience should you ever violate your secrets in Freemasonry. This is an intimidation tactic that's used even in satanic rituals. Freemasonry sets the tone early right away that this is a secret organization. When the candidate is escorted into the lodge, he is caused to kneel and attend to prayer. And here's where he now begins to be conditioned to view God as the deity of any and every religious faith. Freemasonry prays to a God they call the grand architect of the universe, under which you can find, according to Masonry, all the gods. So even though St. Paul says that Jesus' name is the name above all names, Freemasonry says that God is the nameless one of a hundred names. St. Paul teaches that we cannot be yoked together with unbelievers. We know the spiritual axiom, lex orandi, lex credendi. That's because if we pray with Masons, we will begin to believe like Masons. Masonry not only evokes deity in prayer, but it also has unique symbols and names for God. I mentioned the grand architect of the universe. In English-speaking lodges, the God of Masonry is represented by the letter G. And in the Masonic Bible, which they give their initiates, which is a King James translation of the Bible with its own Masonic appendix, it says that the letter G represents, quote, the great God of all Freemasons. 
Masonry also is, uh, the God of Masonry is all represented by the all-seeing eye, which is clearly a pagan symbol going back to Osiris. And every Mason is required to bow in an act of idolatry to these symbols in Masonic ritual. So Freemasonry, through the use of these unique names, unique symbols, and unique prayers, seeks to unite men into a spiritual brotherhood and also the deities of all these religions into a spiritual godhead. This is a monstrous form of syncretism. Because the god of masonry is not the holy trinity, it is a false god, and it's an abomination before the true god. As St. Paul says, there are many gods and many lords, but only one true god and one lord, Jesus Christ. David tells us in the Psalms that all the gods of the nations are devils, and hence the god of Freemasonry is the devil. After the man is involved in this prayer to the deity, the worshipful master, who is the principal officer of the lodge, has him make a profession of faith by asking him, in whom do you put your trust? And no matter what deity the candidate professes, masonry is required to tell him, your trust is in God, your faith is well founded. So, to those who reject Jesus Christ, Freemasonry explicitly lies to them. And that's because the author of Freemasonry is the father of lies. In fact, this position is contrary not only to revelation, but to reason itself. If only two are true, if men hold different beliefs and only one is true and one is false, of course, this denies objective truth altogether because Masonry tells both of them that their trust is in the true God. Blessed Pius IX said, nothing more insane has ever been devised by the mind of man. And so masonry puts this notion, this false notion of human dignity, liberty, equality, fraternity, all above truth, exalting man over God, which are the heirs of Russia and the heirs of Freemasonry. Next, the man is required to swear an oath at the Masonic altar which is called in Freemasonry the place of sacrifice. It's called the place of sacrifice because, number one, the man gives a blood oath that I'm going to describe, and number two, because he sacrifices his former religion for the religion of Freemasonry. If the man professes to be a Christian, he swears the oath on the Bible. And he swears that he would rather have his throat cut across, his tongue torn out by its roots, his chest torn open, his heart plucked out, his body severed in twain, his bowels taken thence and burned to ashes, rather than violate his Masonic oath. These oaths are self-curses, and these types of oaths obviously are gravely sinful, and they evince this offering of blood. These descriptions of the penalties are called blood oaths, and they confirm the covenantal nature of these oaths. You know, covenant is, is considered an interpersonal communion. We know that from our theology. And blood has always been symbolized, whether it's offered actually or symbolically, to ratify a covenant. When the man offers the blood oath at the Masonic altar, he's sealing the covenant of Freemasonry in which he is now bound. It's at that point that that noose is removed from his neck, and he's called a brother for the first time. Why? Because he's now in covenant communion with Freemasonry. These oaths are portals to Satan and the occult and serve as obstacles to grace. With these curses, Masons swear to violate the temple of the Holy Ghost on the very scriptures he inspired. After he swears the oath, the hoodwink is removed and he's, quote, brought to light. And what he sees before him are the Masonic square compasses, and the volume of the sacred law. If he professes Christianity, that will be the Holy Bible. But it doesn't have to be. The Bible can be accompanied by or replaced by any religious writing. The Zendavesta, the Sohar, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, you name it. Just as Masonry views all gods as equal to the Trinity, it views all religious writings as equal to the Bible. And this, again, is contrary to reason. The Bible affirms the divinity of Christ, the Quran rejects Christ's divinity, and yet Freemasonry holds both of them to reflect God's will, certainly authored by the devil himself.
This cult of man continues when the mason is presented his white apron. You may be familiar with masons wearing aprons in their uh, rituals. And the mason is told that the white apron represents the purity of life and conduct which is essentially necessary for him to gain admission into the celestial lodge above. He's also prevented with a common gavel, a hammer, which he's told that in the olden times where operative masons used to use the gavel to chip off parts of rough stones, he's told by his own natural efforts that he can perfect himself and make himself worthy for God as a living stone for the spiritual building of heaven. Of course, the Council of Trent condemned this notion that man can do anything spiritually beneficial by his own natural efforts. This was anathema, and hence the teachings of Freemasonry are anathema. In the Master Mason degree, which is the third degree of Freemasonry, Masonry teaches its most sublime doctrine, the resurrection of the body. And in the Masonic Bible, I quote, it says, the resurrection of the body constitutes an essential dogma of the religious faith of Freemasonry. In this degree, which is called the legend of the third degree, often called the Hiramic legend, the candidate partic participates in an allegory. He's caused to represent a person named Hiram Abiff, who historically did work on King Solomon's temple, but this legend is created. It's a fiction. It's, it's something that masonry made up. And essentially, the candidate is said to have secret knowledge, Gnostic knowledge, that fellow craft masons are seeking from them. And inside the lodge room, he's accosted, he refuses to give up Masonic knowledge, and he's martyred. He's literally hit over the head, he's caught in a sack, he's told to, to lay down, and symbolically, he's murdered. Well, King Hiram looks for the body, and to make a long story short, it's eventually discovered by virtue of a green sprig of acacia that's planted next to the grave. And in the ritual, it says that Hiram Abiff was executed outside the gates of the city, like our Lord, a mockery of our Lord's death. The Masonic ritual also says that Hiram was buried on the brow of a hill west of Mount Moriah. Again, a mockery of our Lord. The ritual also says when they approach the dead body in ceremony, they make what's called the hand, uh, grand hailing sign of distress. And they say, O Lord, my God, is there no help for the widow's son? Is there no help for the widow's son? The widow is our lady and the, and the son is our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a satanic parody of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. After the candidate is then raised up by the worshipful master, he tells him that this symbolic raising testifies to Freemasonry's belief in eternal life. And when the man literally dies his natural death, he can have a Masonic burial service in which he is clothed with his Masonic apron, similar to a baptismal garment, and all of his Masonic brothers deposit that sprig of acacia by which Hiram's body was found. They deposit that on his chest and they commend his soul up to the grand architect of the universe. The popes and Our Lady have called Freemasonry a religion, a sect, and a cult. And now can you see why? Masonry has its own religious doctrines, its own rituals, its own unique prayers, its own names for God, its own symbols for God, its own names for heaven, its own symbols for heaven, its own theology, its own burial rites, its own covenants. It has a chaplain. It has vestments. It has meeting places called temples. It has consecration rites for lodging. It has music. It has feast days which mock Christianity. The feast day of John the Baptist on June 24 and John the Evangelist on December 27. It has its own calendar. Freemasonry doesn't use Anno Domini. They use Anno Lucis, Lucifer, the year of Satan. They add 4,000 years to 2010. So in Masonry, it's 6010. Masonic authorities also say Freemasonry is a religion. And the popes have called Masonry the synagogue of Satan. And now we know why. Now, let's recall Our Lady's warnings at Quito, which prefigured Fatima. Remember that she said, Freemason will reign, Satan will reign, almost exclusively 
through Freemasonry in the 20th century, and the church would be punished for heresy, impiety, and impurity. And these things have been confirmed by Our Lady at Fatima. So what have we seen since 1960, the year that the third secret was to be revealed? Well, we had a council which decided not to condemn errors for the first time. To confirm doctrine, the church has always condemned the errors that affect the doctrine. And yes, this didn't happen, especially Russia's errors of communism and atheism, again, at the very time the secret was to be revealed. There was a failure in expressing doctrine on a pastoral level. This is, none of this is dogmatic, as we know, or definitive, but on a pastoral level. Instead of using the precision that the church has always used, they used ambiguous phraseology, and many examples could be given. For example, the word subsist, that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, giving the impression that the Church of Christ is somehow larger than the Catholic Church, that it also includes heretics who reject the papacy. That's not what the Council said, but these types of ambiguous phrases lend themselves to modernist interpretations. The Council also gave unprecedented favorable opinions to non-Catholic religions, which are obstacles to salvation, all evincing a, a Masonic spirit of unity over truth. In fact, we might even maintain that the Council issued a new doctrine, again, not dogmatic or definitive, but only a policy or an attitude toward religious liberty, where the Council said for the very first time that man has a right, not just a, a freedom, not just a subjective freedom, psychological liberty, but a, an objective, natural right based on his dignity in nature to religious liberty. How can that be? Man does not have a right, a God-given right, to disobey God. Man does not have a right to worship outside the church. Russia adopted this view of religious liberty in 1997, and this has caused Catholics from being able to evangelize in Russia. And religious liberty, I think, is at the heart of the problem in the church, and it's certainly at the heart of the teachings of Freemasonry. In fact, we have Masons praising the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. The French Freemason, Yves Macedon, wrote a book called Ecumenism Viewed by a Traditional Freemason. And he says, and I quote, all roads lead to God, and this free thinking pouring forth from Masonic lodges has spread magnificently over the dome of St. Peter's. When Freemasons are praising the teachings of an ecumenical council, there's something wrong with that ecumenical council. We've also had a different expression of the Catholic faith in the 20th century. We've had a new mass that was concocted out of thin air by Annibale Bunini, whose own autobiography provides evidence that he was a Freemason. And it's no surprise that the Ottaviani Commission said that the Bonini Mass does not reflect the theology of the Mass as dogmatized by the Council of Trent. The Pope also allowed six objective heretics who reject the theology of the Mass to consult on putting the new Mass together. Utter confusion in the Church. Remember Our Lady warned at Quito about the corruption of the customs. What about the novelties? that have come into the church in the 20th century. Communion in the hand while standing, the priest facing the people, altar girls, a vernacular canon said aloud, Protestant hymns. Again, a corruption of the ecclesiastical customs of the church. We now have high churchmen praying with Protestants and Jews and pagans as if we're all on the same level without any exhortation to join the Catholic church to save their souls. And yet these same high churchmen view Father Gruner, view the priests of the Society of St. Pius X, and other faithful Catholics who hold the faith of all time as outside the church. Only the devil is the author of such confusion. And third, we have the morality. Remember the warnings at Quito, heresy, impiety, and impurity. And so what do we have in the 20th century? We have a clerical sexual abuse crisis in the church unlike anything we've ever seen. 
where pedophile and sodomite priests are free to roam and commit crimes against children. Our Holy Father, Pope Benedict, in spite of what the media says, is certainly doing something about this. Reminds me of the future Pope Pius XII's warning against the suicide of altering the faith of the church in her liturgy, in her theology, and in her very soul. There has been a Masonic revolution in the Catholic Church in the 20th century. There's been a reorientation of the church to the world since 1960, the year that the third secret was to be revealed. In fact, I'm being kind when I call it a reorientation because Sister Lucia called it a diabolical disorientation. She used that term so many times one wonders whether that terminology is actually part of the third secret. All of this is tied to the message of Fatima and the failure to heed Our Lady's requests. So in conclusion, we now know why Our Lady has warned us of Freemasonry. These messages are at the heart of Quito and Fatima. Uh, we also know uh, that there is a part of a text that has not been revealed. That's beyond dispute. We even know not only the nature of that text, but characteristics about the text. 25 lines, one sheet of paper, Portuguese idioms, sealed. You're going to hear all about this this week. But the warning was that Fatima and at Quito, a Masonic ideology will enter into the church, presumably through an ecumenical council, and will inspire its leaders to abandon tradition and lead souls to damnation. We also have had consistent and explicit testimony from many about the, what the third secret means. But we're gathered here this week because we believe it's not too late, that the worst of the prophecies can be avoided, an even greater apostasy, the annihilation of nations, is still conditional, depending upon when Russia is consecrated. So what can we do? Of course, we have to pray, but we have to educate others about the message of Fatima so that we can couple our prayer with theirs. We know it includes the daily rosary, five first Saturdays, the scapular making reparations, but specifically for the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in union with all the bishops. Only when the consecration is effected as Our Lady requires will the church be restored to her former glory. Until then, she will continue to suffer her passion. The smoke of Satan will not dissipate. In the end, however, Our Lady's Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Pope will consecrate Russia, and she will crush the head of Satan and destroy his Masonic enterprise forever. May it be this Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, who finally obeys heaven's command. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us.